Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome indeed to Professor Greg Radick's uh, inaugural, inaugural lecture as Professor of History and Philosophy of Science. It seems only the other day when I and a number of colleagues were interviewing an alarmingly bright historian of biology from Cambridge for a post in the History and Philosophy of Science. It was, in fact, 12 years ago, but in that 12 years, our appointee has, with meteoric rapidity, risen from Cambridge Junior Research Fellow to Leeds Professor. Already at that interview, Greg's reputation as a rising scholar had preceded him. He had won the 1998 Singer Prize of the British Society for the History of Science for his essay, Morgan's Canon, Garner's Phonograph, and the Evolutionary Origins of Language and Reason, later published in the Society's Journal. This essay was to grow into a monumental work, Greg's 2007 book, The Simian Tongue, The Long Debate About Animal Language which gained him another prize, the Suzanne J. Levinson Prize, for the best book in the history of the life sciences and natural history. He hasn't yet won the Eurovision Song Contest. Um, that particular prize has as yet eluded him, but uh, I'm sure not for long. Greg's interests are wide-ranging. Uh, that's an understatement. They involve never fewer than two disciplines, and sometimes three or more. I recall his speaking with unfeigned enthusiasm at the interview about the Darwin College lectures he had organized at Cambridge, the published collection of which he co-edited. The theme was space, one of those topics that draws physicists, psychologists, historians, literary theorists, and philosophers together, along with other topics like time, mind, meaning, and the souffle. Uh, <laughs> certainly an interdisciplinary uh, symposium there. This drawing together and energizing of different groups is something I associate with Greg. He and his Leeds colleagues in the history of science, Graham Gooday, Chris Kenny, John Topham, Sophie Weeks, and Adrian Wilson, form a formidable group. And Greg's time as chair of what we used to call the Division of the History and Philosophy of Science, now the center for the same, was marked by a period of notable success for this group in bids for conference grants, research grants, and collaborative doctoral awards. One lasting, indeed we hope permanent, initiative from Greg's time as chair, led by Adrian, Graham and Greg, and now directed by former Leeds HPS PhD Claire Jones, is that at universities, museum of the history of science, technology, and medicine, bringing together the university's rich heritage of scientific and medical apparatus, which, but for timely intervention, might have ended up on a skip somewhere, or some of it anyway. Part of this collection can be found in the Gillinson Room in the philosophy department, including some uh, truly distressing uh, Victorian medical equipment. Uh, other exhibits, including the Asprey X-ray diffraction camera, are at the entrance to the department. Another particularly valuable part of this heritage, incidentally, is on display in the foyer just outside this lecture theater, the Newland Phillips machine, which models economic change hydraulically. I guess it might be needed elsewhere in Europe just now. Central to much of Greg's research, of course, is the towering figure of Charles Darwin. And if ever there was a time in the last few years to be researching Darwin, this was it, with the 150th anniversary of the publication of The Origin of Species falling in 2009. That year was marked by the appearance of the second edition of the Cambridge Companion to Darwin, which Greg co-edited with John Hodge, who has kept the Darwin torch burning in Leeds since the early 1970s. It was also marked by an intriguing monograph, one might almost say detective story, concerning Darwin's visit during that dramatic year of the origin, 1859, to the spa town of Ilkley. If at any time in the last three years you had wandered into the Grove Bookshop in Ilkley and headed straight for the local interest section, you might have found, sandwiched perhaps between E by Gum, a guide to Yorkshire dialect and Victorian privies of the West Riding, a slim but informative volume entitled simply Darwin in Ilkley, and wisely not subtitled The Great Man's Adventure Oop North. Co-written by Greg and Mike Dixon, Emeritus Professor of Gastrointestinal Pathology, it asks, what was Darwin doing in Ilkley during those weeks of 1859? Well, without giving too much away, Darwin was there to seek water cures for a mysterious ailment, the nature of which Mike is able to infer from the records. But as Greg explains, this was also a pregnant period, a time just before the publication of The Origin, when Darwin was making final corrections, addressing objections sent by correspondents, and anxiously anticipating reception of the work. Beautifully written and beautifully illustrated, Mike and Greg's book is a wonderful instance of what one might call a duograph, uh, 
pursuing two apparently independent themes, one medical, one intellectual, but linked by a person, time and place, and which are interwoven in ways that enhance both. Incidentally, both Greg and Mike are Ilkley residents, a happy coincidence of research interests and domestic arrangements, something which few of us can boast, which is just as well, really, when you think what some of us work on. A final word. <laughs> the, the name Radic invites speculation. Suggestive as it is of a Latin root, indeed, the Latin for root, radix, from which, of course, we derive the term radical. And Greg is a radical. As a historian of science, he's inquiring into the roots of intellectual change. As a philosopher of science, he's inquiring to the roots of human thought. Surely we should capitalize on this somehow. Well, the conferring of a personal chair is not normally accompanied by the award of a coat of arms, something of a missed opportunity, in my view. But in the absence of any formal procedure of this kind, I have devised a coat of arms for Greg myself. <laughs> and here it is. Uh, since you may not be able to distinguish the uh, design very clearly from where you're sitting, I will describe it to you in what I hope is appropriately uh, uh, official heraldic language. Purpale, sable, at argent within a borgia, vert, a radish, rampant. <laughs> below which the motto, ad radicem, to the root. So, Greg, I present you with your new coat of arms, and ladies and gentlemen, I present you with Professor Greg Raddick. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I did not see that coming. <laughs> Traditionally, at Leeds, or so I've been told, uh, these events, inaugural lectures, begin with a procession led by someone holding aloft the university mace. So I thought I was leaving tradition behind uh, tonight, but uh, I like this tradition. I hope it continues. Um, many thanks, Robin, for that introduction, and thank you all for coming this evening. It's a thrill and a privilege for me to get this chance uh, to share with you something of what I find so captivating about the history and philosophy of science, especially as pursued here uh, at the University of Leeds. Uh, so for all that I dispense with the ordinary ritual, I'm going to nevertheless go with yet another one, uh, the family photograph. These are a couple of mine. This is my family, circa 1978. That's me with actually two subtly different stripy shirts. Uh, <laughs> my sister Karen, uh, father Stuart, and mother Esther, all of whom I'm delighted to say uh, are here this evening. And for anyone who belongs to a family, which is just to say for anyone, a question that arises is simply, what is it exactly that we inherit from our parents? Right? They call it family resemblance for a reason in our looks, our temperament, our tastes, these kinds of continuities characterize families. What accounts for it? What lies behind it? What is it exactly that parents transmit to their children and when their children grow up to become parents themselves that they transmit to their children? <laughs> these are my two, Ben and Matthew, who are here this evening as well. We've let them out of the box uh, <laughs> just for the evening. And when we pose this question to the sciences, the answer that comes back uh, for over a century now is simple and clear. What gets transmitted are genes. And it's an answer credited above all to this man, Gregor Mendel. And Mendel is someone that students at Leeds in 2012 meet in their textbooks like genetic students over the past century as the founder of their science, founder of the science of genetics. And on that same page, the students are introduced to the experiments that made Mendel so important. And you're familiar with all of this, but just as a reminder, right, we're told that Mendel reckoned that the garden pea would be an especially suitable choice for studying inheritance because it had a suite of easily tracked either or hereditary characters, seed color, was either yellow or green. Seed shape was either round or wrinkled. Flower <coughs> color, 
in the pea plant, either purple or white. And then we're told that Mendel cleverly spent a long time purifying his stalks, making sure that his purple flowering pea plants only ever gave purple flowering progeny, and that his white flowering pea plants only ever gave white flowering progeny. They became true breeding. And only at that point did he proceed with the experiment, cross-fertilizing, collecting the seeds produced, planting them, and then making a remarkable discovery. What he found is that the plants grown from the seeds when they produced their own flowers, produced flowers which weren't lilac, they weren't mottled, purple and white, they were uniformly purple. So, a remarkable empirical discovery, a new pattern. And then he went on to explain that pattern powerfully and simply. Suppose, Mendel said, this is what we learn in the textbook, suppose Mendel said that underlying the purpleness of the purple flowers, there is a purple-making factor. You call that big P. And there's nothing but big P's in the purple flowering plants, right? Because they only ever give purple flowering progeny. And suppose likewise that underlying the white flower is a factor for white. Call that little p. And again, in your white flowering stalks, because you've purified them, you know there's nothing in there but little p. So big P in the purple flowering pea plants, little p factor in the white flowering pea plants. When these are brought together in the course of cross-fertilization, they meet, but we only see the effects of the purple making factor. And that tells us that purple is dominant and that white is recessive. And that's roughly what that means. When brought together in a hybrid plant in this way, one is seen, visible, expressed, the other is not. And Mendel goes on from there, we learn in the textbook, to explain further patterns with further extensions of this same basic pattern. Now, you don't have to wait till you get to university to learn all of this. Uh, I have taken this from my son's Horrible Science Annual, 2010, which conveys the essentials uh, in a good-humored way. Uh, that's uh, including uh, pea jokes. There's Brother Mendel explaining why there are no peas for the wicked, uh, and so uh, no soup for him. That's Hippocrates down in the corner dancing a jig, because even as we learn uh, as Mendel overturns Hippocrates' teaching, at least on the Horrible Sciences version, that the hybrid plants ought to have intermediate characters. He's nevertheless overjoyed because Mendel's factors get a name derived from the Greek, gene. So that satisfies Hippocrates. And it's reinforced in our culture more generally in any number of ways. Here's a mouse mat, obey Mendelian principles, it's the laws of inheritance. I actually have a tie that says that, but the taste got the better of me for this <laughs> evening. You can get that on baseball caps as well. And it shapes our responses to the world, rightly or wrongly. This uh, knowledge that we all somehow picked up somewhere along the way, we don't quite know how, about Mendelian genetics and how it works. Uh, a friend of mine tells a story about a couple that she knows. Uh, the uh, husband and wife both have light-colored eyes, and they had a daughter, and the daughter had brown eyes. And his mother let them know that according to Mendelian principles, that wasn't possible. <laughs> there must have been a violation, and it probably wasn't of Mendel's laws. <laughs> They, as you would, of course, reacted furiously to this insinuation, and they did just what we would do. They went to Google, <laughs> typed in, is it possible for blue-eyed parents to have brown-eyed children? And of course, the reassuring message comes back, yes, blue-eyed parents can have brown-eyed kids and other eye oddities. <laughs> and what you learn in the article is that contrary to the simple Mendelism that everybody kind of learns but nobody quite remembers how or where, it isn't the case that eye color is determined by just one gene. It turns out that there are lots of genes which are responsible for eye color and they interact with each other in complex ways so that every which option is a possible outcome. <laughs>
Now this gap, the gap between what's widely taken for granted as true scientifically and what's actually the case is a theme of perennial fascination for historians and philosophers of science. But it's an especially timely one in this year, in 2012, because it marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of a book whose exploration of that gap uh, has been hugely influential and in some ways remains unsurpassed. It's called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas S. Kuhn, and that's Kuhn there, published in 1962, 50 years ago this year. <coughs> if you uh, know the book, very likely it's on your short list of uh, the most, one of the most important books of the 20th century. If you don't know the book, you'll surely know uh, some of the jargon which comes from it, the paradigm shift, which has become a cartoonist's uh, treasure, so overuses it. I especially like, what's that boy? A paradigm shift? Big changes in mindset. Everyone talks of paradigm shifts. Well, paradigm shift, that phrase, was introduced into English in Kuhn's book, where it has uh, a rather precise meaning. For historians and philosophers of science, it's an important book in many ways, but not least because it introduced what we sometimes call the historical turn, which is to say that after the publication of the book, it became possible to see new ways in which History Matters for the Sciences, to come on to my subtitle. This is the famous first sentence of the book. History, if viewed as a repository for more than anecdote or chronology, could produce a decisive transformation in the image of science by which we are now possessed. Now, by what image exactly did Kuhn imagine his readers in 1962 possessed when it comes to science? Well, the short answer uh, is that uh, Kuhn was concerned about the image of science represented in textbooks. This is the textbook in genetics used here at this institution. In Kuhn's view, as he pungently put it, learning about the history of science from a science textbook is like learning about a foreign country from a tourist brochure. The history presented in textbooks is propaganda. It's systematically misleading about what happened in the past, in that it represents past research questions, problems, individuals, as all leading to the science being taught in the textbook. And although Kuhn's book is entirely about the history of physics, Mendel is a case in point. Again, one meets him in the textbook as the founder of the science of genetics. Now, historians of genetics disagree a lot about Mendel, but one thing they do agree on is that whatever he thought he was doing in experimenting with hybridized pea plants, he wasn't trying to found the science of genetics. Inheritance, in the sense we think of genetics being concerned about, just wasn't on the agenda for Mendel. And that's how it goes in science textbooks generally, Kuhn thought. So they're deeply misleading about the past, but they're misleading for a purpose. Because what science textbooks are trying to do is to induct the student into the approved ways of solving problems in that field. That's what's going on when students learn about Mendel's experiments. These are paradigms in Kuhn's sense, in a rather precise way. For Kuhn, a paradigm is a kind of heroic research achievement, which showed the rest of the field how to do it. And then learning about Mendel's P experiments, the student is learning both about how inheritance works, but also crucially how to think and reason like a geneticist. And that knowledge is consolidated in the problems at the back of the text. That's where the real learning happens. That's where the paradigm gets instilled in Kuhn's view. And I've chosen an especially witty one from this genetics textbook. Here's what we get. After a few years of marriage, a woman comes to believe that among all of the reasonable relatives in her and her husband's families, her husband, her mother-in-law, and her father have so many similarities in their unreasonableness that they must share a mutation. A friend taking a course in genetics assures her that it is unlikely that this trait has a genetic basis and that even if it did, all of her children would be reasonable. 
diagram and analyze the relevant pedigree to evaluate whether the friend's advice is accurate. <laughs> now, I'll tell you the answer later. You're on your medal. But so is the student. And what's happening to the student, the ambitious student who comes across this problem at the back of the chapter? The question that occurs is not, are uh, the concepts developed by Mendel, the Mendel of the textbook for analyzing P's, the right concept to extend to this problem? Rather, the only question is, am I clever enough to figure out how to extend the principles to solve this problem. And there's a right answer. And if you get the right answer, you get good marks, and on it goes. And in the course of a good scientific education, day by day, week by week, chapter by chapter, the problems get a little bit harder. The solutions extended in ever more clever ways. And the student who follows these things along becomes ever more deeply invested, cognitively and emotionally, in these tools. And this, Kuhn says, is why scientific revolutions are so wrenching and so dramatic. Because scientific revolutions are those moments when a younger generation comes along and declares the older generation's tools the wrong tools, no longer up to the task. And then they rewrite the textbooks so that no one ever knows. <coughs> so there's still a huge amount of insight in Kuhn's book, still very much worth reading 50 years on. Nevertheless, from the vantage point of 2012, there are any number of ways in which my colleagues and I now see deficiencies in Kuhn's book, ways in which we'd want to supplement it, ways in which we've moved beyond where he took the field in 1962. And so what I want to do in the remainder of my time, first of all, is to highlight what for me are three of the most exciting ways in which the field uh, has gone beyond Kuhn. And I'm going to do that uh, while at the same time uh, giving you a sketch of a new way of telling the story of how Mendel's experiments came to matter so much to occupy the place that they do in our science and in our culture. And I hope in the, the course of the lecture uh, that I'll throw at least a little light on the two ways of reading the theme in my title, Scientific Inheritance. Uh, first of all, there's simply the obvious one, the science which studies inheritance, genetics, and its history, but also more generally, all of the science that gets inherited, all of the ways in which the sciences, like us, carry their history with them. I hope that I can throw a little bit of light on both. Now, my point of entry into uh, the new way of thinking about uh, Mendel isn't with Mendel himself, but with these two. Uh, these two men, rather less well known, Walter Frank Raphael Weldon and William Bateson. They were born respectively in 1860 and 1861. They met in Cambridge, where they were studying zoology in the late 1870s, and they became friends, though there was a kind of an instability in the relationship right from the start, in that Weldon, uh, a year older, seems always to have outshined Bateson in one respect or another. And this was an instability that increased in the 1890s as their careers progressed, and Weldon developed a habit of criticizing Bateson in print whenever he thought Bateson's work merited it. So that's worth bearing in mind. By 1900, they looked to be set for very different kinds of careers. Uh, Weldon is the Lineker Professor of Zoology at Oxford, and Bateson is hanging in by his fingertips at Cambridge, where he's basically in charge of the wine cellar. Uh, at uh, one of the colleges. But 1900 sees changes which bring about uh, quite a reversal of fortune for these two. 1900 is famous for historians of biology and for biologists as the year in which Mendel's paper, which is published in 1866, is rediscovered. The paper was never completely forgotten, but it was absolutely a matter for specialists until 1900. In 1900, it became a talking point throughout European botany. And William Bateson and uh, Raphael Weldon responded in very different ways to this development. For Bateson, between about 1900 and 1902, increasingly uh, he became persuaded that Mendel's paper represented a new foundation for a truly scientific science of inheritance, one which would be experimentally precise and quantitative. Weldon, by contrast, came to think 
that any attempt to put Mendel's work at the center of the understanding of inheritance was wrong-headed and indeed a massive backward step for biology. And in 1902, he published a critique. Now, before I get there, it's at least worth mentioning that in the history of biology, the tradition right up to the present, that's a recent book uh, chronicling these events, is to treat Weldon's critique as kind of willfully obstructive and confused. And my mission over the next few minutes is to try to give you a little bit more intellectual sympathy for his point of view. And I'm going to start with a couple of color plates that he published with this article in 1902. The aim of which is to suggest to you that Mendel's laws of inheritance don't seem to work even for peas. So Weldon took it upon himself to collect hybrid <coughs> pea varieties and to study them. And you can see some of the results here. Just concentrate on the uh, top line there, cells one through six. Absolutely, some of the peas were green, some of the peas were yellow, but some were kind of greeny yellow, some were kind of right in the middle, some were yellowy green, and on it goes. In other words, nature actually presents a continuum in this character trait. It isn't either or. No one's peas look the way Mendel described his peas looking. Likewise with wrinkledness. One thing you would never guess with a head full of Mendel, says Weldon, is that sometimes descendant pea varieties in their wrinkledness recall not their immediate ancestors but distant ancestors. So to take this case, with these peas, their wrinkles resemble much more closely not the variety that they descend from, but this much more distant variety. Now what's going on here? Isn't this just nitpicking? In the textbooks, Mendel is celebrated precisely because he had the genius to cut through all of the complexity that nature presents and find the kind of underlying simplicity and underlying order. Well, I'm going to try to give you two ways into uh, Weldon's way of viewing it. The first is with a joke, an old joke. It goes like this, right? nighttime. Guy's walking down the street, sees another guy down on his knees looking around. First guy says, what are you doing? Second guy says, well, I dropped my keys on the other side of the street. First guy says, so why are you looking here? Second guy says, well, the light's better here. <laughs> Oh, good. I was hoping, I thought at least Ben and Matthew probably didn't know that. Uh, now, one way of understanding Weldon's point of view is that as he sees it, doing experiments a la Mendel in the name of understanding inheritance is an exercise in looking in where the light is better rather than where the key is, the key that unlocks the most profound mysteries about inheritance. It suits us to eliminate all of the variability that creates complexity, and then to generate patterns which are simple and which can be treated with simple combinatorial mathematics. But there's no reason, in Weldon's view, for regarding what you produce thereby as somehow basic, foundational, fundamental. It's just arbitrary to do that. You've created an arbitrary order. Furthermore, at the same time, you're failing to heed the lessons of complexity. That's actually what we wanted to know at the start. How does inheritance really work? Not some artificially engineered simplistic version of inheritance. So my way into that point of view is with a joke. Weldon's way was with the history of science. When he tried to uh, bring his, audi his audience on board, teaching students and others about his views, he recalled an episode from the recent history of physics and chemistry. Middle years of the 1890s saw a new column added to the periodic table, the noble gases, starting with argon. And as Weldon tells the story, it all hinged on the key investigators, William Ramsey, you see here, and Lord Rayleigh, being unwilling to let themselves off the hook when confronted with discrepancies in their data, not fictionalizing them away. In this case, the difference of hundreds of a gram between nitrogen collected 
from uh, compounds in which nitrogen was liberated, and nitrogen collected from the atmosphere. Atmospheric nitrogen was just a little bit heavier, hundreds of a gram. But not forgetting about that, taking that complexity seriously, led to the discovery of new elements, won a Nobel Prize in 1904. That, in Weldon's view, is great science. It depends on not forgetting what you actually have in front of you, not fictionalizing it away. So in drawing the reader's attention to the natural variability that one would never actually guess from Mendel's exposition, Weldon was trying to suggest to biologists that it was absolutely vital when it came to identifying new patterns, when it came to avoiding misleading concepts, to bear in mind exactly what nature presents them with. And he drove the point home with eye color. Here's what he says. It would almost certainly be possible by selecting cases of marriage between men and women of appropriate ancestry, remember this is 1902, to demonstrate for their families a law of dominance of dark over light eye color or of light over dark. You could get both laws going depending on how you choose your starting materials. Such a law might be as valid for the families of selected ancestry as Mendel's laws are for his peas and for other peas of probably similar ancestral history but it would fail when applied to dark and light-eyed parents in general, that is, to parents of any ancestry who happen to possess eyes of given color. And one remembers in coming across this passage that uh, Weldon's own hero in The Signs of Inheritance, Francis Galton, had in his collection a tin box of glass eyes, which divided them up not into two kinds, light and dark, but 16. I just wanted to creep you out, that's why I've shown you the picture. <laughs> dwell on it a little longer. <laughs> I come now to the first of the departures from Kuhn that I wanted to draw to your attention. In Kuhn's book, really quite remarkably and very condescendingly, scientists only ever take a serious interest in the history of science when it's time to rewrite the textbooks after a massive revolution. <coughs> and without dwelling on the point, uh, I hope that the example I've given you of Weldon and the case of the noble gases is a, gives you some sense of just how much creative, critical insight really good scientists take as a matter of course from the history of science. I'd like to think that uh, taking such an interest is part of the job description of being a scientist. It certainly was with Weldon and for others one might mention, like Charles Darwin. Okay, so back to 1902. Weldon publishes his critique and then the gloves are off in this debate. There follows one of the most ferocious arguments in the whole of the history of science, most recently called the Mendel Wars. For Bateson's part, he was very energetic and successful at recruiting clever allies to the cause. You see him sitting here with a man named Reginald Punnett, famous to genetic students the world over for the Punnett Square, a way of tracking the changes as inheritance and making, uh, making the predictions go correctly. He also published the first textbook in Mendelian uh, inheritance, Mendel's Principles of Heredity, a Defense. That came out later that spring, 1902. It was intended as a rebuttal, a very rude rebuttal to Weldon and Weldon's attack. But it went on to su have successive editions in which the attack on Weldon dropped away. And what it did effectively was to set the template which genetics textbooks keep to this day. Mendel's experiments show us the first step. The rest is extension. And when the extensions don't work, apologies, supplements, complication. But it all starts with Mendel and his peas. Bateson also was hugely involved in marketing Mendelian inheritance, as it came to be called genetics, to farmers and breeders. With true principles comes useful techniques. And right from the start, Bateson represented Mendel's insight as giving to the breeder at last the kind of power the chemist had 
to plug qualities in and out. At last, the breeder would no longer have to follow along in the paths of tradition. And again, recruiting students, experimental plots were set up at Cambridge and elsewhere, aiming precisely to show the power of Mendelian views in generating new breeds, useful breeds. It should be mentioned as well uh, that in talking up the usefulness of this perspective, uh, Bateson didn't shy away from its usefulness to eugenics, the breeding of better people through science. His was an era, of course, in which everyone, scientific more or less, was supportive of eugenics, and Bateson was as well. It's nevertheless the case that Mendelism was seized upon by the eugenicists as especially uh, apt for their cause, suggesting as it did that quite complex traits could be uh, governed by single genes. And I've put here a chart of eye color from the Nazi period. What about Weldon? Weldon was different. Weldon spent those years, 1902 to 1906, trying to develop an alternative science of inheritance. He knew what he was against. He knew that he thought it was a mistake to put Mendel's experiments at the center. But what would an alternative look like? He worked on a manuscript theory that he never completed. And with my colleague Annie Jameson, who's here somewhere, uh, I hope to put out, there she is, I hope to put out an edition, uh, we hope to put out an edition in uh, the near future, an annotated edition of this book. It's a remarkable book, not least for historians of biology who think they know what Weldon stood for. I just want to mention a couple of features now. One is no surprise at all, which is his commitment to statistics. Statistics were so important Weldon thought, because it was only with statistical language that biologists could describe variability precisely. And again, he thought that the really huge insights in science, the great leaps forward, depend precisely on not forgetting about discrepant data, all of the variability that's out there. And statistics was absolutely crucial for doing that. What is surprising is the emphasis in the book on experimental embryology, which was one of the premier sciences in biology in the late 19th century. An awful lot of the book reviews experiments like the one pictured here with the protozoan stentor. Experimentalists were fascinated by how you could cut a stentor in the ways you see here, and then the different parts would grow to become individual organisms. They had these remarkable powers of regeneration. And the lesson that Weldon drew from all of this extraordinarily classy biological work was that dominance was not something permanently associated with a biological tissue. What was expressed biological by a biological tissue depended radically on what was next to it. Radically, con well, that word's now used up by, uh, by Robin, <laughs> but uh, uh, fundamentally context dependent. One would never guess that the middle bits of the stentor could grow to become an entire stentor until the tissues surrounding them were removed. What Weldon builds in the book is a view of the expressive capacities of the uh, hereditary factors uh, as depending on interaction, interaction with each other, interaction with their environments, biological, physical, chemical. Quite extraordinary and quite unlike what we've been told about Weldon. So, 1906, this debate comes to a halt. Because Weldon uh, dies of pneumonia, some said from overwork and stress. And the field was open for Bateson to develop his program to the textbook glory that he later achieved. Now, a question that arises in cases like this when someone dies in harness right, with their work unpublished is what if? This is a timeline of alternative histories. So real history travels a path from some originating event to point A, but we can imagine an alternative path, little a, that it, history didn't take but might have. Likewise from A to B, but we can at least speculate on little b. What might have been? What if Weldon had lived? What if he'd been more successful than he actually was at recruiting clever young people to the program, marketing his point of view to agriculturalists and doctors and others? 
Could there have been a Weldonian science of inheritance? What would it have looked like? Would it have been anything like as successful as the science of inheritance we actually have? I am persuaded that these kinds of what-if questions or counterfactual questions, as they're called, are really very important for all of us, but for historians and philosophers of science especially. They're important historically because if we don't pose and try to answer these questions, we can't actually weigh the significance of anything. And to that extent, we can't really explain. Did Weldon's death matter? Well, it didn't matter if you think that Mendelian genetics would have come along in one form or another and eventually settled down to something like the form it did. So these kinds of questions matter historically. They matter philosophically because what's at stake in confronting them is our sense of what scientific knowledge is and what makes it worthy of esteem. Traditionally, one thinks of scientific knowledge as the absolute pinnacle of human reason. And that's partly to do with its reputation for being objective. And what it is to be objective, it often seems, is in part to be independent of local human events. One group of people would come to hold something for true, another group would hold something for true, but eventually, if science is working well, all will converge at the end. Or will they? So the counterfactual questions matter here too. Finally, they matter scientifically. What if there could have been developed out of that manuscript a Weldonian science of inheritance? And what if that science would perhaps yield insights into patterns and processes that we now lack because of the way our science has grown? What might we be missing about understanding the world and how it works? Now I come to my second uh, departure from Kuhn because Kuhn very much encourages the asking of these kinds of what-if counterfactual questions, but doesn't encourage what seems to me a very promising way of answering them. Because in Kuhn's view, on the encouragement side, whenever a paradigm comes into being, it has in it, in his lovely phrase, something which is arbitrary and accidental, which is what makes scientific revolutions inevitable. Whenever a paradigm comes into place, there's always some way in which arbitrariness means it won't knock together with the world. And eventually a revision will be required. So a kind of contingency is built into Kuhn's vision of science. But it seems to me, if you want to know, could there have been a Weldonian science of inheritance, an obvious way forward is to just try and make one. Go ahead, see what it looks like. But the message that readers took from Kuhn's book is that this is an absolute no-no. Historians of science were to keep away from the sciences. Famously, an article said, should the, asked, should the history of science be X-rated for scientists? The concern was that the sciences on Kuhn's vision function well, precisely to the extent that they have no outside interference. Scientists get to choose what counts as the interesting problems. They get to choose what counts as a good solution and what counts as a decent extension of that solution. And there was a concern that it would induce a kind of collective nervous breakdown in the sciences if stu students and their teachers began to see what they were doing as just some kind of tribal induction process, which isn't that far away from the way Kuhn represents it. I'm delighted to say that that taboo is breaking down in all kinds of ways in the field. A number of pioneering figures uh, are here tonight. Uh, in my own case, it's taken the form of thinking about genetics pedagogy and textbooks. These are remarkably conservative. From Bateson's day right through to the present, students start with Mendel's P's. And then all of the complex information accumulated by the biological sciences in the intervening century is kind of stuck on. So the points that Weldon was making about the interactive nature of genes and each other, genes and environment, these are now acknowledged. Every biologist would I'm guessing, uh, re recognize themselves as represented in that view. And yet the textbooks remain Mendelian with any notion of gene-environment interaction tucked in along the way. Does it have to be like that? What are the alternatives? Is it possible to imagine a genetics pedagogy in a Weldonian spirit which set off differently? Suppose instead of starting with Mendel and his peas, you started with something genuinely representative of how genes function in bodies, 
like the contribution that your genes make to the condition of your heart. This is a case of interaction on a massive scale. Lots of genes interacting with each other and in complex ways with diet, <coughs> nutrition, all of these things changing as the organism matures. What would happen if you set newbie students thinking in the first instance about cases like that? And if as you developed your instruction, week by week, chapter by chapter, you foregrounded gene-environment interaction as pervasive and primary, not secondary and selectively present. And eventually, let's say chapter 8, which is roughly where they learn about gene-environment interaction now, by chapter 8 they get to Mendel and his peas. But they see the pea case as a special case. These patterns do arise, but they arise only under special conditions. Notably, when humans have engineered these organisms into being, right? deliberately excluding variability that's unwanted. What would those students be like? One prospect is that they might have a slightly different attitude than many of us have to the notion that genes are somehow super causes. That they determine, genetic determinism is the, the label often given to this view. They would insist when confronted by claims that a discovery has been made about a gene for some trait, they would insist on knowing exactly which genetic backgrounds was that claim assessed against and against what range of environments. Because they will insist that any such claim implicitly includes such a range, but often it's kept under wraps. And it's striking going back to that question that I've left hanging. Just how this works, how determinism creeps into biology textbooks even as they proclaim themselves to be against determinism. Right? So in this case, right, the friend assures that surely unreasonableness isn't a genetic trait. But hypothetically, suppose it were. And notice what happens from saying that the trait might have a genetic basis. One goes on to treat it, and again, you'll only get the problem right if you treat it this way. You go on to treat it just as you would a gene for yellowness or a gene for purpleness. Right? Genetic basis, what does that mean? Well, it means something which is interacting. You could call it an environmental basis, but of course you'd think about it rather differently if you were told that reasonableness had an environmental basis. Now, I told you I'd give you the answer here. Uh, the approved answer to this question is that the friend's advice is wrong. Uh, the children would have a 50% chance of being unreasonable, whether unreasonableness is a dominant gene or a recessive gene. And uh, I've actually got the uh, answer at the back of the book here for anyone who wants to have a look at it later. I'm sure you got that right. Now, these questions about what students uh, presented with this alternative pedagogy, a Weldonian pedagogy in spirit, and Weldon has a remarkable passage in this manuscript in which he says, there is no character which is either all innate or all environmental. Every character is to some degree or another the upshot of interaction between the two. Well, uh, genetics uh, pedagogy specialist uh, Jenny Lewis has recently written the following. When helping students to develop their understanding of basic genetic concepts, it can be useful to reduce complexity by adopting a traditional linear view of gene expression. One gene, one protein, one characteristic. But there is a risk that this will result in a deterministic view of genetics in which every characteristic is determined by a single gene. The reality, unexpectedly confirmed by the Human Genome Project, is that there are very few single gene characteristics or disorders in humans i.e. the world is not Mendelian. Rather, the relationship between the genome, the entire DNA sequence, gene expression, and the environment was shown to be considerably more complex than anticipated. The result is a move away from a focus on single genes, genetics understood narrowly, and towards a consideration of the whole genome and its interactions with the environment, internal and external genomics. 
Uh, Jenny is based here at the University of Leeds. I don't know if she's here. Uh, she was hoping to be so. But Jenny and I hope uh, to actually start a project putting these ambitions into practice uh, very soon so that by this time next year we'll actually begin to get a sense of what students coming through this kind of a pedagogy will actually look like. So watch this space. Okay, back to my counterfactual history of the science of inheritance. Suppose I've brought you this far and you're persuaded that there might have been a Weldonian science of inheritance and it would have been interestingly different from Mendelian genetics and that this science that might have been, might have developed through the 1920s, 30s. How far can you go with this? Well, if you're anything like me, you'll be brought up short by biotechnology and its wonders. Now, everyone will have their own jaw-dropping example. Here's my favorite. These, uh, this is an example of a, a goat on a farm in Canada, uh, which carried in its genome genes for spider silk, which it produced in its milk. These were transgenic goats. So the technicians in this biotech firm in Canada figured out how to take freeze-dried spider, turn it into a powder, extract from the powder a gene for spider silk, modify it, introduce it into a goat egg, fertilize the goat egg, and a goat would be produced that can do this, unifying spider and goat. When I think about cases like this, I think, well, be as sophisticated as you like about gene-environment interaction, but basically Mendel got it right. If we can do this, if you can take a gene for a spider silk, take it out of a spider and plug it into a goat, and it works, well, if Mendel hadn't come up with those concepts, somebody else would have, because clearly this is how the world is, and our current level of technological success depends on it. Go back to the eye color case I started with, right? In a few years, the mother-in-law in that family won't have to just insinuate based on her high school biology. She'll be able to whip out her personal sequencer, take a little bit of hair from the child and uh, the mother, and, and the father, and, and just check, right? These are, this is the world we live in. Astonishing things happening technologically. Now I come to my final departure from Kuhn. What light does Kuhn throw on the links between scientific inquiry and technological progress? The short answer is none, quite deliberately. This is what he says at the start in his preface. For condensation's sake, I have said nothing about the role of technological advance or of external social, economic, and intellectual conditions in the development of the sciences. And increasingly in the field, there is impatience with a theory of inquiry which has nothing systematic to say about the relationship between the advance of scientific knowledge and technological change, in all of the social change and economic change that tends to go with it. Now, this complaint is almost traditional at Leeds. Uh, in a previous incarnation of the HPS unit, it housed another American named Jerry Ravitz, who in 1971 published this book, Scientific Knowledge and Its Social Problems. I've not met Jerry Ravitz, but I've been enjoying hugely, as have my colleagues, rediscovering his work. And this is a case where you can learn a lot from the covers of books. Kuhn's book has on it a Necker cube. For Kuhn, science is all about thinking and seeing. Whereas for Ravitz, it's also about rockets, trains, and planes. Now, Ravitz's vision of science is, of course, a venerable one. It goes back to Francis Bacon, who uh, at the start of what we've come to call the scientific revolution, proclaimed knowledge is power, and generally promoted the view that with the uh, arrival of new truths will come new useful techniques. And this notion of a link between truth and usefulness has been a major inheritance that we've uh, got from our sciences from Bacon's day right on forward. Here at Leeds, 
a number of us are trying to uh, think of how to uh, in integrate these, a uh, theory of inquiry and uh, the uh, changes in technology and society by thinking about intellectual property and whether there's a notion here which, if treated expansively, might help, might help us get an analytical grip. Might there be uh, relationships between ownership claims made about discoveries, right? getting your name on there first because you found it first, ownership claims made about inventions, getting the patent so other people can't profit from it, and the way that whole fields take ownership of practices, the way that Bateson managed incredibly to represent plant and animal breeding as owned intellectually by Mendelian genetics. Maybe intellectual property will prove to be a fruitful notion here. That's what we're exploring. But let me come back directly to the counterfactual question I left hanging. Could we have got to our level of technological success without Mendelian genetics. Well, Leeds is a brilliant place for thinking about this question and for doing so in the technologically engagé spirit uh, that I've just been talking about. Because as Robin uh, mentioned in his introduction, uh, we have here at Leeds, in our Museum of the History of Science, Technology, and Medicine, an X-ray camera from investigations which in the 1930s produced the first photographs of DNA. It was, uh, uh, taken in the laboratory of William Astbury, seen there with his PhD student Florence Bell. And Astbury was hired at Leeds as a textile physicist. That was his title. The cloth makers at Leeds decided that it was in their interest to fund someone to study fibers in a fundamental way because if one understood how fibers were put together molecularly, maybe one day you'd be able to synthesize them. So that's what brought Asprey to Leeds. He was a physicist. It's entirely possible to uh, imagine a counterfactual history of molecular biology which leaves out genetics until roughly the 1950s. So it's at least uh, worth exploring whether one might, in counterfactualist mood, rerun the tape, leave Mendel out, see how molecular biology develops and see whether, at the end, you get textbooks which are interestingly different from the ones that we actually have. And maybe you get silky goats at the end, too. I'd like to think that you could. So there ends my sketch of the one sense of uh, scientific inheritance I mentioned at the start. The sketch of the history, which I hope to write uh, more completely in a, at book length, about how Mendel and his experiments came to occupy the place that they do in our science and in our culture. I want to turn finally and to wrap up to the second sense of scientific inheritance, all these ways in which history matters for the sciences. Come back to that famous opening sentence of Kuhn's book. My own sense is that historians and philosophers of science still very much endorse this view, but what they mean by it is somewhat different from what Kuhn meant by it in 1962. We no longer think that scientists only take an interest in the history of science when they absolutely have to, when it's time to rewrite the textbooks. On the contrary, the history of science is a resource for scientists in the thick of debate, in the course of scientific change, not just after it. Nor is it the case that all we want from historians of science are ever more complete descriptions of the past. When it suits their purposes, it's okay for them to actually interfere a little bit with the sciences. And I'd like to think that if my uh, project with Jenny Lewis, uh, revising genetics pedagogy, is a success, that it would be of interest to geneticists as well as to historians of genetics. And finally, that image of science that we ought to aspire to, I don't think there's really an appetite anymore in the field for a vision of science that leaves out the teeming world of technological and social change. And the image on Ravitz's cover was itself, of course, uh, a, a legacy of Bacon, not just thematically, but iconographically. This is the title page of Bacon's great instauration. And there again we have it, a transportation machine, in this case a ship about to pass through the pillars of Hercules, the metaphor for the limits of knowledge 
in the ancient world. And there at the bottom is a Latin motto. Whoops. Multi per transibunt et algebitur scientia. Translated for me by my colleagues uh, Sophie Weeks. Many will go to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. And I think it's moving to remember that when the University of Leeds was founded, when it paradigm shifted out of being the Yorkshire College of Science, the latter part of that phrase became the university's motto. And I was pleased as I uh, was preparing this lecture to discover that Jerry Ravitz, in bringing his book to a close, also was put in mind of Bacon and his great inspiration. And he quotes a passage from that book that I want to read out to you. Uh, it's one in which Bacon's great themes of knowledge and power come out, but in this case, Bacon's recommending that they be tempered, handled with care, or as he puts it, uh, with charity. So this is Bacon. Lastly, I would address one general admonition to all, that they consider what are the true ends of knowledge, and that they seek it not either for pleasure of mind, or for contention, or for superiority to others, or for profit, or fame, or power, or any of these inferior things, but for the benefit and use of life, and that they perfect and govern it in charity. For it was from lust of power that the angels fell, from lust of knowledge that men fell, but of charity there can be no excess, neither did angel or man ever come in danger by it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.